Okay, welcome everybody to this session of the Humanitarian Network Practice, Practice Week on Assistive Technology. Our, our session is on health system strengthening, looking at the integration of assistive technology as a critical component. And we're really excited that we've got such a good panel here. And um, this is really timely. Um, yesterday saw the launch of the first global report on assistive technology. So this panel comes at a very um, timely moment. Uh, my name is Maria Kett. I'm Associate Professor of Humanitarianism and Disability at the Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare here at University College London. And I'm joined by an illustrious panel who I will shortly introduce. i uh, just give a bit of um, context to the panel first. Um, as I said, yesterday saw the launch of the first global report on assistive technology which highlights the inequitable access to assistive technology around the world, particularly in humanitarian settings. Many of you might have um, watched the um, session, which was moderated by Najim Musafa, who many of you might know is a Syrian refugee who now lives in Germany. And she spoke really eloquently about how her assistive technology, her wheelchair, her walking frame, her glasses, her tablet, really have helped her in her journey from Syria to settle in Germany. But we know that Najim, Najim is lucky. Many children and adults living in conflict and emergency settings don't have access to assistive technology, not even one bit. Um, and that's what we want to focus on today in our panel. Um, I launched into that without uh, a further ado of the housekeeping. Um, we have sign language interpreters. Um, we should have closed captioning. However, if it's not available to you, we will be able to um, record the session and ensure that you are um, uh, able to access this after. So the um, links will be shared to um, attendees of the panel. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A box and or in the chat box, and uh, we will have time, plenty of time for discussion today. The overall objective of this session is to really sort of generate a dialogue about this access to humanitarian, uh, to uh, assistive technology in humanitarian sit, um, settings and how to better integrate AT into the response and programming. And we've got a really interesting panel here today to discuss that. We want to think about a number of things. Um, we want to look at how we exist, uh, strengthen existing systems, particularly health systems, but there's a question, isn't there, about, you know, tying AT, assistive technology, only to a health system, but how can that health system itself be strengthened, particularly during emergencies and conflict? Um, how can assistive technology be better integrated into humanitarian responses? And these are some of the questions we've asked the speakers to focus on. We've asked them to think about the needs and gaps in terms of access to assistive technology. We heard yesterday very clearly about the, the global um, gaps around access to assistive technology. But we need to be thinking about assistive technology as just beyond mobility aids. We've also asked them to think about the challenge of integrating assistive technology into preparedness and response planning, and what particularly is needed to address this. We've asked them particularly for examples of what's worked well in this context, you know, what lessons have been learned around the provision of assistive technology and delivering assistive technology in humanitarian contexts. We've also started to explore, you know, we know that many of the guidance and standards that are out there now, the ISC guidelines on humanitarian people with disabilities in humanitarian emergencies, sphere standards, etc., do talk about assistive technology, but what more do we need to know and do? We particularly want to focus on the um, um, perspective of end users of assistive technology who include people with disabilities, but also older adults, people with mobility needs, etc. And that's a really important point, right? Assistive technology, as we heard very clearly at the launch yesterday, benefits all. It's not just around um, one group of people. So we're really, I'm really pleased that we've been joined by an excellent panel to discuss these issues. Over the course of the next 90 minutes or so, we'll hear from each of the speakers, which I will, who I'll now go on to introduce, and then we'll open the floor for comments and questions. As I mentioned, please put your comments in the chat box, which my colleague will be um, monitoring, and um, we will also be um, able to have a discussion at the end of the colleague at the, of the um, session. I am joined firstly by my colleague Joel Berman, who is Director of Operations at the Global Disability Innovation Hub, particularly the Community Interest Company. Joel works across the international development sector, specialising in the management of delivery of large global programmes. His technical background is in development economics and public administration. And Joel is going to talk about the role, um, the program that he's been leading called um, AT2030. So more of that shortly. The next panelist is Gavin Woods. Gavin is the Disability Research Manager at UNICEF's Office of Research, the Innocenti Centre. He's previously been a Senior Research Fellow at Cranfield in the UK, and he has worked in UNICEF since 2010, um, initially in supporting the earthquake relief in Haiti. And then he's been working in the Office for Emergency Programmes leading on data and information. Um, and I met Gavin some years ago now, since 2018, Gavin has focused on disability inclusion. He has de been developing their research 
portfolio, particularly in that area, and is currently leading the development of a global research agenda and platform for children with disabilities to amplify the voice of children and youth with disabilities through a network of academic institutions, researchers, policymakers, donors and practitioners. And we look forward to hearing what Gavin has to say on this subject shortly. Emma Petty is from CBM Global Disability Inclusion. She has been with their humanitarian team since 2018, providing technical and managerial support to humanitarian operations and preparedness in work in many countries, including Bangladesh, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Indonesia. Emma is currently in Kenya. She has a background in both occupational therapy and development and is engaged in numerous initiatives around rehabilitation in humanitarian crises, providing technical support and disability inclusion, program development and knowledge management. So we're very much hearing what you have to say about that, Emma. Very fortunate to be joined by colleagues from Indonesia, Dr. Sari and Arshinta. Dr. Shari, I don't know if we can see you, Dr. Sari, is a medical doctor with a wide range of experience in emergency response, disaster risk reduction and community health issues. She's been working in the Yakum Emergency Unit since 20, 2005 as health coordinator and project man manager after the tsunami response. She's now managing the Yo know, Training Center around uh, specifically on disaster preparedness and, and disaster risk reduction. She's director of um, U for the past 20, 10 years and manages more than 50 responses and various disaster risk reduction projects. Um, I think Dr. Sari, we'll really learn from your huge wealth of experience. She's director of the development in humanitarian, uh, uh, sorry, Arshinta is director of the Yakum Development in Humanitarian Programs and she has enormous expertise in disaster management, project management, capacity building, disability inclusion. Um, she's trained at the incident command system in Indonesia. Um, she's also had many positions in the ACT Alliance. So really interesting to hear how that your work in Indonesia fits with the wider global humanitarian response system. Um, she's a member of the governing board of Red R Indonesia, Red R Australia. Um, she has initiated community-based mental health models in 30 years on her in her work across Yakum's programs for the past 30 years in cooperation with CBM. Um, these continue, including the um, supporting self-help groups and youth groups and the protection of persons with psychosocial disabilities. And we really very much look forward to hearing your experiences in Indonesia. And last but not least, Nadia Haddad. Nadia, I finally get to you. Uh, Nadia is the Vice President of the Brussels City Advisory Council of Persons with Disabilities, a member of the Brussels Region Advisory Panel of the Belgium Supervising Commission for the Independent Mechanisms for the Implementation Monitoring of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in Belgium. She is also a member of the International Disability and Development Consortium, co-chair of the board for the European Network on Independent Living and a member of the executive committee of the European Disability Forum. Nadia has a degree in electromechanical engineering and she specializes in mechanical conceptions, um, water resource engineering, ecology, environmental coordination and philosophy. And Nadia, we very much welcome your perspective from the from, from EDF, so welcome to join us. Um, many of you might have noticed that we were meant to be joined by Diana Hiscock from Helpage International who were were our partner in the research that I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, but unfortunately, Diana is in Afghanistan and cannot join us today. However, we are very lucky to be joined by our colleague Mohammed, who helped participate in the research in Jordan. I hope Mohammed is in the audience and I hope Mohammed will have some comments um, after we've had the panel presentation. Um, I will move on to the panel presentation very shortly, but I just want to touch on a couple of, um, I touched a little bit on some research that we've done in collaboration with CBM and HelpAge International. Um, this was under the auspices of the AT2030 programme, which Joel will shortly introduce. And this research focused on looking at access at Rohingya peoples in Cox's Bazaar and refugees from Syria and Yemen living in Jordan. The report will be available on our website very shortly, but I, I wanted to sort of highlight a few of the findings from that report to frame this discussion. We looked at a number of overarching questions around what do we know about current need, how is it currently met, gaps in evidence, and mechanisms to ensure the provision of AT. And, and we really wanted to sort of look at what people were actually doing and how they were actually accessing AT. We know about the barriers. We know lots about the barriers and the World Report really highlighted that, including in the humanitarian context. But what are people currently doing and how can we leverage some of those um, issues that people are currently doing? Um, I won't belabor the point. We interviewed 79 people around in Bangladesh and Kenya and we used the WHO frame, five P's framework, products, people, provision, place and policy. And, and really, what was quite striking was how similar the findings were in the, in the very different contexts. We know, of course, that the provision of assistive technology, in, our, in this case it was mainly assistive devices, was very ad hoc and largely through NGOs and community groups. Um, we also learned that the devices alone do not 
um, ensure wider inclusion. And this is a really important point that, that the devices alone, the technology itself isn't, isn't, it can't be um, useful without a wider system change. We also know that the, how the provide how the funding is provided for devices really matters. There's very little research around the nexus between social protection and humanitarian responses, particularly for people with disabilities and how things are funded in that context. Um, we certainly found that many of those people we interviewed lacked other support mechanisms to enable them to access their rights to work, education and healthcare. And this really perpetuates this idea that people who need assistive technologies are vulnerable and just waiting to be assisted rather than thinking that given the right support and, and um, resources that people would be able to be much more independent. Um, we certainly know, and this was highlighted in the World Report yesterday, wasn't it, that there needs to be an increased investment in and focus on how healthcare systems are strengthened to respond to the growing need for assistive technology. And hopefully we'll discuss that over the course of this session. And I think a final thing, and obviously from my perspective, we really need more translational research, which takes the data that we are starting co to collect in humanitarian context. We were often asked to provide sex, age and disability disaggregated data but yet, are we turning that into um, effective evidence-based services? And that's a really key question to ask, isn't it? Um, our report makes a number of recommendations, which luckily do time with those of the global report. Um, we, we've talked about products that assistive technology should be provided in core healthcare provision in emergency settings. And I know my colleagues in Indonesia will talk about that. Um, an interesting finding is the need to so invest more in local production, repair, distribution at, at the local level, and hopefully Joel will speak to that. And um, in terms of people, we know that there's a need to think about how we provide more disability specific social protection and how we think about um, how that might also link to compensation. Um, we also need to think about how assistive technology isn't enough. We need to address stigma in accessible environments, support and training to really ensure people regain or, or gain independence. Um, in terms of provision, we know there needs to be more provision of AT through existing public health mechanisms um, and much more joined up provision. And that's perhaps one of the questions we might think about here today. I'm talking a lot about the healthcare system but that does call into question what, what's the role of other systems such as the education or indeed the social protection system. Um, the thorny issue of budgeting, there has been some work done that talks about how much budget should be put, um, put into um, humanitarian response plans for non-food items, which would include AT, um, some debates around the percentage for that, that might come up in our questions. Um, yesterday in the World Report, we, we certainly know there is talk of a, um, an assistive products priority list, APL, specifically for humanitarian context. And again, that's something that the panelists might wish to touch upon. What, what are the priority products needed in a humanitarian context? And are they different to the existing 50 priority products list that the WHO already have? Um, how are people with, um, with AT needs being assessed in humanitarian context? How's that being standardized? We certainly know there needs to be more collaboration and coordination across the clusters. I think that's a perennial call for everything. And, and we know there needs to be more um, specific policy to address some of these issues. So these are just some of the things that came up, some food for thought. Um, I'm now going to turn over to the panel to hear their thoughts about some of these issues. And I first turn to my colleague, Joel Berman, who will present an overview of the 802030 programme to set these in the wider context. Joel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, Naomi, could I share, um, could you stop sharing so that I can share my screen? Thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to you uh, participants wherever you are around the world. Um, uh, thank you for giving the time to, to talk today and, and uh, to engage in, in the material that we'll be presenting. What I'm going to be talking about uh, as Maria introduced, is a program called 802030, which is uh, ours and one of the UK's flagship programs on assistive technology and disability inclusion. And uh, as you can see there, we started back in 2018 and we've got a bit of a way to go. So you're catching us at sort of a, a midpoint in the program. Uh, my name's uh, Joel Berman, I'm the Director of Operations for the Global Disability Innovations Hub, and we are uh, a research and practice centre which focuses on, on disability innovation for a fair world. We come out uh, as one of the legacy organizations from the 2012 Paralympic Games, which really was a high watermark for, for disability inclusion in the field of sport, um, both in the way it was conducted and engaged, as well as the, the site that was created to host it. Um, and as a legacy, we're created in two parts. One of them is a community interest company 
uh, and the other is an academic research center based in UCL. So we are a marriage of um, research and, and, and high quality research into assisted technology and disability inclusion and a vehicle to go out into the world as a social enterprise and, and deliver uh, disability innovation. What I'm going to try and cover today, um, hopefully quite briefly, is a little bit of a view on, on the partnership that we work through to deliver our work, uh, the program of 802030, uh, which is an 80 focus project. So it's, it's context really uh, to, to, to the work of, of humanitarianism within, within uh, and assistive technology. Uh, so to give you a bit of a, a wider scope of the work that we do, uh, what the program is, where we are at about halfway through our delivery, and, and maybe some sense of, of, of the direction of travel that we see in assistive technology coming out of our work and coming out of the engagement that we support. And I've talked about GDI Hub, but really uh, it's not just us. Uh, we work through a very wide partnership uh, and there are lots of people on this slide, but this is already uh, a subset of the nearly 70 organizations who have, who have engaged with 802030 to date. Uh, and you can see the diversity of, of the kinds of people that, that help to make uh, this program a success. Large multilaterals, bilaterals, uh, NGOs from, from the global north and the global south and private sector organizations um, uh, to no end and, and, and as well as academic partners that you can see there. So it's a wide partnership and it continues to be a running theme of our work. So all of the progress and the delivery I'm going to talk about uh, really should be prefaced with a thanks to, to the people on this slide and more who have helped it kind of uh, bring it to life to date. So 802030 really is about testing what works. We, we pilot we trial, we research, we, we gather insights to understand what's going to work to improve access to life-changing assistive technology for all. Uh, as we heard yesterday, and as we'll see as the evidence um, is more widely disseminated, more than 2.5 billion people need one or more forms of assistive technology, things such as wheelchairs, prosthetics, hearing, age, or hearing aids, or a, a range of different digital tools and support for cognition, that support cognition, and, and a, a, a wide range of other assistive technologies. The need is enormous and it will continue to grow um, over the next 30 years and beyond. And yet against that uh, exceptional requirement for assistive technology, uh, within LMICs, um, access can be as low as 3% of that need. Uh, and so it's on that basis really that 802030 in 2018 was created. And we aim to reach nearly 30 million people uh, through our work across 35 countries. And it represents an investment of nearly 20 million pounds from UK aid, and that's doubled by contributions from partners and third party funders to, to increase the program to nearly 40 million pounds of investment uh, to increase access to assistive technology. And when we talk about um, the program, when we talk about our method of increasing access, really we're talking about innovation. And for us in the program, it means a number of different things. It can be new forms of assistive technology, trialing, researching, uh, and scaling new assistive technology products, uh, fitted and, and suitable to LMIC contexts. It means supporting the ventures, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the disabled users and disabled entrepreneurs who can help create small, and medium-sized companies to deliver that AT. It also means supporting service delivery models for assistive technology. So if you have the product and you have the providers, you're still need, needing a way to, to deliver it, to provide a, a assessment, fitting, support, uh, training around assistive technology. And we look to innovate in that space also. And then, as I mentioned, as a research and, and practice organization, creating the ideas and the evidence and the data runs across our work. So we want to see the ideas and the methods and the approaches that are created through our program disseminate to other countries, other organizations, so that um, we continue to be part of a, a global movement to increase access to assistive technology. We do this uh, in, in four sort of clusters of activity that, that speak to the work that we do. Um, we seek to build data and evidence in an environment that has historically not you know, um, paid sufficient attention to AT. Uh, I can't remember which panelist it was during the launch of the global report yesterday said that it was you know, frankly embarrassing that this is the first report on assistive technology. Um, and we've been uh, there since, you know, since 2018, trying to build uh, along with partners, this increasing evidence base uh, for AT. And that includes the work that Dr. Kett leads on AT in humanitarian context. As I mentioned, we're all about innovation. So we want to spark innovations right from small scale um, innovators and entrepreneurs with ideas that seem to work in their context right through to middle and later stage businesses that might want to see their existing products scale and pivot into disability inclusion or into LMIC context, contexts, all with a view to increasing uh, the, the scale and the ecosystem to provide assistive technology. 
Uh, alongside uh, and across these pieces of work, we work at the country level as well, really to lay the foundations that shape markets to be able to understand and integrate assistive technology as a core product. And the system level change, be it economic, policy, political, and uh, societal that is needed to support that demand and supply. We drive and try to push pilots around the availability and the affordability of assistive technology, opening up market access through the provision of strategic tools and pilots, and through the delivery of country capacity assessments, really set the baseline to understand what is the need for assistive technology and what are the strategies and requirements at the country level to help increase access uh, through stakeholders and partners. Across all of our work, partnership is key. So in all that we do, we're building partnerships and working um, at the local level, at the national level, at the multilateral level, um, to build capacity and understanding around assistive technology, and importantly, working with communities and disabled people to shape what those solutions uh, and what the requirements really are. We continue to leverage the legacy of the Paralympics, and uh, we'll, we'll see in a moment some of the, uh, the impacts that we've seen, that we were very present in Tokyo, helping that to broadcast across Africa. Um, and provide digests of this inclusion for the first time, um, really speaking to the continued role that sport and parasport can play in tackling stigma around disability. Also from that legacy of helping to design the Olympic Park in London, we have a broad spectrum of work on the built environment and inclusive public spaces and, and how these uh, intersect with the provision of AT and the lives that disabled people lead. So approximately where, where are we in our journey? I said we're about halfway through. So we're aiming to reach, uh, you know, uh, approaching 30 million people. In this graph, you can see that we've reached just around, just touch over 22 million so far. But alongside that big number, along the way, we're also collecting these deep impact stories of, of the personal level significance that assistive technology plays in people's lives. Um, I'd encourage you to go onto 802030.org where you can find a, a catalogue of these stories that talk about people's different experiences of assistive technology in different contexts, as well as um, the impact of COVID. Um, and how the provision of assistive technology really has a life-changing impact um, uh, be, you know, beyond the, the meeting of the evident uh, sort of rights-based need. We've done a lot in the last few years and I can't cover it all, but here's um, a, a pretty packed slide that touches on some um, relevant uh, delivery across the four clusters of our work. And I've tried to pull out those which speak most closely to uh, humanitarian and informal contexts. Uh, you can find on our website upwards of 150 papers, studies, influencing papers, insight papers around this question of what works to increase access of AT. As, as Maria um, introduced, we know from the get-go that it's more than just buying products and shipping. There is a wider systemic change needed uh, to, to understand, diagnose, provide and support assistive technology. And a lot of our research is pitched at understanding exactly that. Uh, and that includes academic research um, in uh, peer-reviewed journals. We've done upwards of 25 of those, and we'll continue to deliver that as the program delivers. Uh, we were an instrumental partner, and very proud to be a partner with WHO, UNICEF, and others on the launch of the World Report on Assisted Technology, providing research into that, and we'll continue to use that landmark and milestone report to help inform our work going forward. Um, and uh, we'll see a bit later on how we um, aim to help support the dissemination of AT-focused research through uh, online data portals. Our work on innovation has had two really big flagship launches as well. We created the first AT investment fund um, for uh, sort of more established ventures to scale and grow um, uh, in LMICs with AT investments and venture support. And we supported Africa's first assistive technology accelerator for earlier stage disabled entrepreneurs and innovators and innovators and entrepreneurs creating disability inclusive products based in Kenya. And we see that model scaling also globally. Um, and it's from that work, working with innovators and working with entrepreneurs and investors that we've seen 30 new forms of assistive technology be supported to date. Uh, and we continue to see them scale up towards development and production, including, for example, AT that speaks to the delivery in remote settings. So we had a partnership with Humanity Inclusion, for example, that focused on the use of 3D printing for prosthetics and orthotics in remote settings. And we'll see some, some imagery later on that reflects a similar approach across our work. Um, we've, in, in addition to supporting the products themselves, we've supported upwards of 27 uh, AT focused entrepreneurs to date. And from us, they receive more than just money, but also expertise and partnership and an understanding about how their product fits in a wider ecosystem of change. Um, and that also relates to the innovative service delivery models that we've supported through pilots and scaling across six African countries. And that can be 
uh, service delivery from assessment to fitting or service delivery of things like capacity building training for public health professionals. Also at the country level, uh, we supported 10 80 country capacity assessments, which as I, I mentioned, really set the baseline for where countries are at in increasing access to AT. And um, it, was, it, it, it was a proud moment to see in the response uh, to uh, you know, the tragic humanitarian context unfolding out of Ukraine, to see a country capacity assessment not conducted by us, but using the CCA model, used to inform uh, a response to how disabled people caught up in that crisis could be best served. Uh, so we trialled that methodology along with the WHO and the Clinton Health Access Initiative across 10 countries, and we continue to build out from that um, to implement action plans at the country level. And that's included uh, the commitment of nearly five million US dollars from those countries to support investment in AT. That can be committing a budget line, unlocking public uh, investment to provide access to AT. This is you know, a long term, uh, locally driven commitment to AT access. I talked about shaping the market. For us, that's, that's looked like five landmark, landmark product narratives, uh, which help to provide in-depth analysis to identify the key barriers um, and uh, the promising market interventions across the value chain from research and development right the way through to production procurement, uh, all the way downstream to service delivery that helps um, kickstart the um, increased investment and commitment to assistive technology at the country level. Um, and as I mentioned, we've worked uh, closely with the WHO, and one of the areas that we've worked closely with them on is the creation of training on assistive technology. It's a new topic to many, uh, and we've met that challenge head on by creating uh, training, for, uh, assistive training for assistive technology uh, that can be delivered at the country level to public health professionals, to non-experts, to introduce uh, the topic and help build capacity to provide and engage with AT. Across all of our work, as I mentioned, is capacity and participation. We see numbers coming in now of approaching just over 57 million viewers um, of the broadcast of the Tokyo Paralympics uh, across 49 African countries and territories, which otherwise would have missed out on this momentous uh, celebration of parasport and disability inclusion. Um, and also at the country level, building out from our work in the, the Olympic Park, we've worked in uh, cities across the world to understand how the built environment informs the lives of disabled people and users um, in a variety of urban environments, including in informal settings. And we'll continue to see the, the growth and convergence of that um, work in the built environment expand to other topics such as climate resilience. I'll talk a bit about, more about that as we, um, as we reach the end of the presentation. As I mentioned, we, we're seeking not just to, to be funded by the, the generous investment from UK aid, and we're, we're proud to say that uh, it's a measure of buy into our program that we can see nearly 30 million pounds contributed by others to help deliver um, across our work. That's the partners that we work through, but also governments and private sector partners and other donors who have helped contribute to the mission of 802030. Um, and, and lastly, uh, just to focus on the fact that this is also included, as well as the, the, the large country level change, work at the community level uh, and work on the informal provision of assistive technology conducted in um, informal settlements in Sierra Leone and Indonesia. We'll see a little bit more about that later on. So this is a very whistle-stop stop tour of some of the work that we've um, delivered, um, but now some, some imagery in terms of what it actually looks like to, to, to aim to increase access to AT. This is um, uh, a picture I mentioned about innovative service delivery models for AT. Um, this is a, an attempt by one of our partners in Paro, um, piloting and, and trialing a disruptive technology uh, based on a new thermoplastic that allows prosthetic technicians to fit a patient um, with a new prosthetic socket in less than two hours. This takes away the need to travel far distances um, uh, to engage with uh, heavy capital equipment and, and, and specialized, specialized staff and large teams to be able to go into the field and, and fit uh, a, a new leg at low cost and um, uh, with, with, with a saving of time. This is some of our work from Mombasa. Uh, in Indonesia, our teams and partners have engaged with uh, disabled people and disabled people's organizations to understand the importance of the built environment, accessibility, uh, to their lives and to the use of AT. And you can see furthermore in this uh, picture, uh, uh, our partner team uh, working also in Indonesia, although in, in, a, in the city of Solo, to work with people uh, who have a visual impairment using tactile maps to understand navigation within a city and work towards the creation of inclusive public spaces that understand um, uh, the, the needs of disabled people and, and build inclusive and accessible um, built environment and uh, public spaces. I mentioned the UK Impact Fund. Uh, we were very proud to be able to support Koala 
uh, who are a UK team uh, trialing this new kind of clip-on prosthetic. So again, um, far from the, the uh, somewhat pr prohibitive cost and time and access of traditional prosthetics, this prosthetic uh, comes in a box and is intended to, to be fit much like a ski boot um, on, onto the user in remote settings uh, with a, a far lower uh, barrier to assessment and fitting and use uh, than is traditional prosthetics, saving thousands of dollars in money. So we, we continue to support that team and hope to see it scale over the future years. Uh, alongside the products and the service delivery models, as I said, we're, we're data focused. So this is a, a, a screenshot of our 80 data portal leveraging the work that we've done on a, a landscape review. So we went out and, and tried to find all the papers written on assistive technology um, and map them across the world. And you can find on this map research into assistive technology by country, by author, with the key findings, uh, with a view really to, to kind of increasing knowledge sharing across the sector, um, sharing knowledge that we create, sharing knowledge that, that others have created to deepen an understanding of AT and deepen the evidence base to inform policy making and decision making. And it's with, with a view to that, that policymaking aspect that we can see here, one example of the work that we've done with policymakers at the country level. This is um, a reasonably recent launch of Malawi's national medical rehabilitation policy. It's one of many policies we've seen um, move from that original country capacity assessment through a recognition of the change needed to increase access to AT and you know, become formalized in law and often you know, supported by the commitment of public funds to increase um, access to AT for the long term. So that's a snapshot of about where we are halfway through. Um, and so some reflections then on, on future directions. Um, we've been working um, on AT in informal settings and temporary settings for some time and remote settings also. Uh, and we can see um, you know, somewhat you know, sadly prompted by um, the recognition of the unfolding humanitarian crisis coming out of Ukraine, a continuing interest in what can be learned from uh, AT in informal settings for broad spectrum humanitarian crises and the provisions of AT. Um, as Maria eloquently said, we see across the board recognition of the, the need for a systemic approach to the provision of AT. It's not enough to provide products. Uh, we need a deep systemic approach to, under, to inform the provision of AT, to create new and contextually relevant AT, to develop it, to manufacture it, to deliver it, and importantly, to repair it. The statistics on abandoned AT are not encouraging. So we know that if we want AT to have a role, we have to get it right in the provision and it needs that full uh, cycle of understanding, development and, and support and repair to allow it to really take root at the country level. We can see um, alongside the systemic approach a building momentum for the, the support for the innovation ecosystem for AT and new players coming onto the market, not just traditional bilateral and multilateral donors, but private sector and philanthropic support um, supporters coming in to support a range of innovators in the AT space from small entrepreneurs right the way through to middling, middling sized companies and established big companies that can see the relevance of their products and services to disabled users and wanting to find a way to pivot into this important space. Uh, a key role that we've been playing is to help to build that case for an investment in AT. Um, the significance of, of, of the rights basis for the provision of AT uh, has allowed a long history. Um, as we saw in the global report yesterday, there's an increased recognition and data that supports recognition of the social, economic, and cultural impact of providing AT. A clear rate of return of providing AT to the economic futures of the people who are um, uh, enabled by it and the wider um, economy that is supported by investment in AT. So to be able to have that uh, data and evidence basis supports further investments for non-traditional players and users who would otherwise uh, not participate in this space. Our work and work of others continues to inform what works, and we hope to see over the next decade those lessons inform further country level data capacity and knowledge building and, and building out and scaling up from the success we've seen. And lastly, we increasingly see a convergence of the areas in which we're working, a convergence of our work in the built, in, built environment and community participation with other topics such as climate justice. And our team were presenting, including Maria, actually, our team were presenting at COP26 earlier in the year, uh, explaining how uh, sustainable cities within the, the, the climate justice and climate change space are inclusive cities, cities that respond to the changing needs of disabled people, of aging people, of people with mobility issues, people who go through all sorts of life changes. But really, if we want to respond to climate change in, in a long-term way, inclusivity has to be front and center of that discussion as well. We also see, uh, the center stage role of disability justice 
in new and emergent topics like education technology, which um, for many of us in the global north was thrown into stark contrast through the pandemic when we were learning and teaching from home, but it's never stopped being a relevant issue across the world. We can see how education technology intersects with assistive technology and disability inclusion in schools. Uh, and lastly, we can look back at uh, the decades of work on gender mainstreaming and see how disability can take a similar journey to intersect and inform the investment that large multilaterals, bilaterals and other donors and partners make in their work so that all work is disability inclusive work, even when it's not explicitly disability work. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much uh, for your time today to listen to the work of 802030. It really is uh, you know, a wide body of work um, that has, uh, that is very proud to be able to support the work that Maria does and other partners on AT within humanitarian context, which will continue to be, uh, you know, a, a main part of our programme and our learning over the course of the programme as it delivers. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Joel, for that really comprehensive coverage. And I think you've touched on a lot of points there that will perhaps be picked up by the um, other speakers. Um, I'm, without further haste, um, I will turn over to Gavin. I think Gavin doesn't have slides, but right. Gavin, the floor is yours. Follow that. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, Joel. Um, so my name is Gavin Wood and um, I am from UNICEF. I want to touch on just a few sort of points that I think matter to us and matter in the humanitarian space. Um, so yesterday, as mentioned, you know, we at UNICEF with WHO launched, launched the first global report on assistive technology. Um, and the numbers have been mentioned already. And I think it's interesting to see that, you know, the previous estimates of 1 billion right now that people in need of assistive technology has been estimated at 2.5, increasing to 3.5. Um, and the disparities have already been noted that only 3.5 no, 3% of those who need assistive technologies in low middle income countries actually have access. And I think when you juxtapose that with in some high income countries, that's around 90% of access. Uh, there's, there's a lot of um, disparity that's needed. And in most humanitarian crises, the need for assistive technology grows and the barriers to its access grow. Um, people with pre-existing functional difficulties may not have or be able to use their assistive product during the crisis and uh, when the humanitarian facilities, services and programs are inaccessible and not inclusive, then essentially we're pushing these people even further behind. So it's really critical. I wanted to say something about the gaps. We're part of this discussion is reflecting on the needs and gaps beyond mobility. So studies um, that have gone into the great report, the global report, um, indicate that the majority of the limited AT provision happens in the acute stage of an emergency, and less so, or even sometimes not at all, in the preparedness planning or recovery stages. We know that those children and older people with existing impairments tend to be neglected in needs assessments, so we need to do a lot more to have those organizations doing these assessments to be sure to include. Uh, a key gap is, is a the technical know-how of how to deploy assistive technologies during humanitarian crisis. Another gap is the lack of uh, coordination amongst the agencies. Maria um, touched on this. Um, and we, including UNICEF, you know, we have a mandate to deploy inclusive strategies and you know we it's a duty to us to make sure that we do that and that is just not happening so that's a critical piece we've mentioned that the the provision of at is typically by a very small number of ngos um, and that focuses almost exclusively on mobility impairments but that is changing so we see the likely uh products that are needed as a priority beyond the mobility aids in the humanitarian settings um, are likely to include uh, continents, um, self-care, cognition, and communication. We're also seeing a shift um, in the attention of digital assistive products. Um, again, this was mentioned in the launch yesterday, where we might start to see more of these devices being deployed to support gaps in education and learning. Um, we're seeing uh, an increasing number of other quickly deployed products, such as accessible showers, toilets, uh, and toilet add-ons, 
pathways and ramps. However, we still see uh, quality and suitability remains an issue. So some users in humanitarian settings have reported that, uh, for example, those wearing spectacles still can't see clearly. And so those, those are issues. And the same goes with wheelchairs. And in some cases, inappropriate wheelchairs are being provided. So transport wheelchairs, as opposed to the more functional day-to-day -day wheelchairs are being provided. So whilst we're providing, we also need to be sure that we're providing quality into standards. And, and I want to make just a last point, because I know time is pressing, because we can touch on others during the discussion. I think the challenges for integration of AT into preparedness and response. So how can we be prepared better? Of course, money and investment is critical. That's been mentioned. But things can only really be sustainable if uh, governments are involved and uh, humanitarian programs seek to strengthen existing uh, health systems or other pathways, for example, schools or facilities where assistive technologies and devices can be uh, administered, supported, etc. From a product's perspective, UNICEF and WHO have uh, product lists and catalogues, uh, and I think these play and will play a critical role in establishing a foundation for integrating assistive technology into preparedness and response planning. Um, and on provision, uh, ensuring that assistive technology is accessible to the frontline staff when emergency medical teams are triaging in those in need. The personnel has been mentioned, that's a, that's a critical area. In most cases at the country level, in our um, more sustainable systems, health systems, there just isn't the training of the key stakeholders. And that's a critical piece. From the community to international level, from managers, staff and volunteers. Um, they need to be aware and everyone needs to understand inclusive policies and practices that incorporate basic awareness of assistive technologies to address functional difficulties. And understanding the critical need for support of assistive technology support systems. So again, getting away from delivering assistive devices without the support and the proper frameworks for identifying needs, for provision, for setting things up and for maintenance. Um, at a policy level, inclusive emergency response policies and programs must ensure rights to access uh, assistive technologies are protected. So I think it's it's important on all of us to ensure that these rights are up front. And if we just recap on the, the sort of main point here, that we have supply catalogues which help to frame and provide the sort of blueprint as to the more appropriate technologies that should be provided. We also need to invest in the infrastructure, but also the personnel to be able to administer the um, the whole ecosystem that's required around assistive technologies. I'm going to leave it there, Maria, with the interest of time, because there are other points, but I think they will come up in the conversation. So back to you. Thanks, Gavin. That was, you really started to link some of those con connections between what Joel said and then the report and, and the work you're doing at UNICEF. Um, yes, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it straight over to you, Emma. Um, I don't know if you have slides or if you're presenting. Yes, brilliant. Apologies, everyone, about the caption issue earlier. So hopefully you can all access them now. Emma, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Maria. So welcome. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. As Maria said earlier, my name is Emma Petty and I'm part of CBM Global Disability and Inclusion. I'm here today, just wanted to talk a little bit about the rapid assistive technology assessment, which we conducted in the Rohingya camp in Bangladesh last year. So I wanted to touch a little bit on some of the key findings as well as what we're doing to now implement those findings in action. So next slide, please. So just as a little bit of a background, the, the RATA was conducted to inform the Global Report on Assistive Technology, which as you know, was, was released yesterday. And so that was the main purpose for conducting the RATA and the RATA is used to identify need and unmet need for assistive technology, as well as the barriers to accessing AT and user satisfaction with AT. So as I said, one of our purposes in conducting the RATA was to inform the, the great, but it was also to look at the uh, scales and drivers of assistive technology needs among the Rohingya population to be able to inform our own programming in the camps. The next slide, please. 
So I just wanted to give a brief overview of how we conducted the, the RATA. It was conducted in all 34 of the Rohingya camps in uh, 2021. Um, when conducting the RATA, we partnered with REACH as well as we, used, um, we did this in partnership with our local partner, the Center for Disability in Development, who provided the training on the conduction to REACH. We conducted the RATA remotely due to COVID through 401 household surveys with 666 individuals and using remote data collection through, like I said, through phone interview. One of the things with the RATA and how we identified our respondents was that prior to the RATA, REACH had conducted an age and disability inclusion needs assessment on the prevalence of persons with disabilities in the camps. And so then respondents for the RATA were randomly selected from those who reported some difficulty, a lot of difficulty, or cannot do it all on at least one domain of the Washington group questions or a lot of feelings of anxiety or depression on a daily basis. And just to note for the, the great, this was the only RATA which was conducted in a humanitarian setting. So next slide, please. So I wanted to touch very quickly on some of just the very key uh, findings which came out of the RATA and then a couple of the really interesting findings that we thought from our side. So from this, we found that 11% of individuals overall reported that they use assisted products at the time of data collection and the use of assisted products increases with age with slightly more males and females using assisted products. I know we touched on earlier sort of some of the key assisted products, so I thought I would share that some of those products which were most commonly used were spectacles, the auxiliary elbow crutches, the shower bath and toilet chairs, the canes, tripods and quadrupods, as well as pressure reduction mattresses. So next slide, please. So one of the really interesting findings that we found here was some of the sourcing of assistive products. And we found that 26% of people actually self-made their own assistive products and 20% of assistive products came from family and friends. And so with this, we were really looking into why less than 50% of people had received assistive products not from any sort of um, NGO. And so we're really, we've been working with Maria on some research, looking at what types of products are being self-made and why people are having to make them themselves, how people are paying for their assisted products, are they borrowing money, is there interest, and what is the local market for the provision of assisted products? And if people are purchasing them in the local market, what is being done in terms of training on their use, on their maintenance, on proper assessment for, for the assisted products? These are all questions which we are, we are trying to answer. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And then another interesting finding we found was around the suitability of assistive products. And what we found was quite shocking was that 80% of respondents said that their assistive products were mo moderately suitable or less suitable. And two thirds of people said that their assistive products were moderately or less useful. So that's a pretty significant chunk of people who were saying that their, their assistive products were not either suitable for them in their home and environment, or they did not find them useful. So now we're, so now we're looking again in, into the research on how the assistive products have impacted the user's lifestyle and ability to participate in their activities of daily living and how the product could be improved to better suit the needs of the user and the environment they live in so that we can be looking at how are we making sure that we are providing the most suitable and appropriate products for people. Next slide, please. Is there a next slide? No, Emma, that was the last one. Oh, okay. Well, Maybe. you know, I had a I had a few more slides. So, you know, I can just I can talk about the slides then instead and we'll leave this one on the on the graph background. Unfortunately, I had some graphs which really sort of demonstrated some of the key the key points. But one of the most shocking things we found was around the demand for assistive products. And the results of the RAS has said that while 51% of people had or oh, 1% of people had met needs, 51% of people had unmet needs. So that's just over half the population of the camp had unmet needs for assistive products with the needs for assistive products increasing with age and over 85% of people over the age of 60 saying that they had unmet needs for assistive products. The products which were, people were saying that they had unmet needs for were similar to the ones with the met needs, but included the spectacles, the shower bath and toilet chairs, the auxiliary elbow crutches, the pressure relief mattresses and cushions, as well as the hearing aids. 
we had done some internal analysis of the access to rehab and assistive technology within the camps and found that over 50% of people still did not have any access to rehab or assistive technology, which does align with these figures that we found through the, through the RATA. So I wanted to just touch a little bit on some of the implications of the findings uh, from the RATA. And what we're finding is, and what we know is that access to assistive technology is a critical component of humanitarian aid as it facilitates the ability of the user to move, see, and communicate. And that the denial of rehabilitation services, including assistive technology, can significantly impact the ability of its users, including persons with disabilities and older persons to complete their activities of daily living and access humanitarian assistance in a dignified manner. So to us, the RADA has demonstrated that there are clear gaps in access to assistive technology, which are combined with the lack of accessibility in humanitarian services and overall the inaccessible environments of the Rohingya camps which create significant barriers for people in need of these products, including persons with disabilities and older persons to access humanitarian assistance and participate in the community life. And that we're seeing that the provision of assistive technology in humanitarian context may require creative solutions to develop products, which can be easily sourced, are suitable for the environment and easily maintained in order to get appropriate solutions into the hands of as many people who need them as quickly as possible. And so on the RATA, one of the questions which was asked was how can we improve access to assistive products? And so the responses that we had was 53% of people had said that they needed more information on where to access assistive products. And one of the reason, ways we're trying to mitigate this would be to make sure that we, with our home-based rehabilitation teams, we're really providing information on the services which are available, as well as working through local community leaders to provide that information, but really showing a huge gap in terms of access to information on services Access to financial support was also noted by 43% of people and transportation and lack of transportation by 22% of people. So other barriers which needed, which we really need to address and is critical when looking at access to assistive tech, how do people finance it and how are people able to reach the services to be provided. And so finally, I just had wanted to touch a little bit on what we are doing in order to promote access to assistive technology in the Rohingya camps. As I said earlier, we're working with our local partner, the Center for Disability and Development, and we are providing through that home-based rehabilitation services that provide rehabilitation services as well as assistive technology. But on top of that, we're really looking at how do we make sure we have linkages between health facility, access to rehab and assistive technology, and that we're shortening the gap between primary health care and when people receive their assistive products if needed. So one of the things we're looking at doing right now and we have is a current partnership it's with the Bangladesh Red Crescent Society, where we are providing rehabilitation services within their facilities, within their field hospital, in order to try and bridge that, bridge that gap and make sure that people who have gone in for the health services at the hospital then receive, receive assistive technology. We're also working quite closely with the health sector in terms of advocacy towards in primary health care actors, including rehabilitation and assistive products within their healthcare programming. And really looking at, again, looking at those gaps in the research and how we can generate further evidence and information in terms of the gaps and facilitators in order to access assistive technology. So that's all from my side. Um, I'm gonna turn back to you, Maria, and thank you very much. And we'll take any questions at the end as well. There is one for you in the box, actually, Emma. Um, thank, look, Emma, that was great. You've really given us some context for this and some some ideas about where we, as a sector, might 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 go in terms of delivery and, and improving access to assistive technology. I'm now going to turn to Dr. Sari and Arshinta in Indonesia, who have some interesting and, and really innovative ideas around this. So Dr. Sari, Arshinta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I'm uh, very privileged and also uh, uh, humble to be given time to share the field perspective from Indonesia. Dr. Sari and me will be sharing our presentations. Uh, but before we continue, let, uh, let us share about who Yakum is. Um, maybe next slide, please. After listening from previous colleagues uh, talking about research and advocacy and policy level, now uh, we are going to bring you down to the field experience uh, after uh, Emma uh, said many interesting uh, uh, research and study uh, from Rohingya. Yakum in Indonesia, 
in Indonesia is an organization that engaged in public health since 1950. And we have a vision that a human being and a healthy environment is achieved through quality health services, growth and uh, development, as well as integration in inclusive society. Through more than 12 hospitals and clinics, also three health institutions, uh, health schools, and three development units working in uh, humanitarian, disability rehabilitation, and community development, equipped with more than 555,000 uh, staffs. Yakum serves disaster affected uh, remote and disadvantaged area across Indonesia. And uh, we are also uh, privileged to work through uh, with local and national as well as global network, because we believe that partnership with uh, those organizations, including uh, national and also uh, global governments and university, also churches uh, from various denominations and other uh, at risk group like uh, people with disability, uh, association elderly and uh, transgenders uh, uh, will make and, and ensure our uh, program and approaches are inclusive. Uh, what we will be sharing you here is our context experiences in humanitarian setting and rehabilitation care. Yeah, works throughout Indonesia and currently I uh, we put some uh, here some spots in red and also currently we have a project uh, together with RMIT uh, in university uh, in, in Australia for digital health hubs establishment covering Timor Leste and Cambodia uh, to look for alternative solutions for AD provisions in minimum settings such as uh, in the developing uh, in the loving countries with minimum uh, uh, it, numbers of uh, educated OP and physiotherapists. Uh, you can next you can uh, visit our website for further information. Here we will put some uh, slides because most of our uh, uh, was it 80 uh, videos are in Bahasa, so apologies for that. But here uh, in, in some slides, uh, pictures, you can see what we are doing in terms of providing uh, 80 in, in disaster context. Next slide, please. Uh, this is what we do in Central Sulawesi, uh, the area that is hit by this uh, earthquake in 2018, and also continue our uh, rehabilitation program until uh, last year. Next, please. And this is uh, some of products that are produced by uh, Yakum Rehab Center. It includes uh, uh, assistive uh, device as well as mobility aid. Uh, from this, uh, actually, uh, we will share you some good practices that we have in integrating AD in the preparedness planning uh, for disaster responses. Next slide, please. Yakum has emergency relief institutions, uh, YEU or Yakum Emergency Unit, but also we all, uh, have Yakum Rehab Center, which produces assistive uh, or mobility devices. These two organizations have agreement and system to integrate physical re rehabilitation in the relief and early rehab packages, including uh, the deployment of manpower like protestic and orthotic uh, specialists, as well as uh, physiotherapists, and certain type of aid as a standby items like a walker, crutch, wheelchair, white can, quad can. And beside this, EU also has a certain agreement with certain medical supply vendors for speeding up the provisions or mobilizations of standard uh, AD, such as wheelchair and sticks, something that are easy to uh, be uh, sent to uh, other islands. It is, uh, next slide, please. Uh, it is uh, saving time for effective rehab care and also treatment. And it helps in boosting trust from the at-risk group that are affected by disaster because they know that they are not left behind, of course. And this is uh, one impact that we feel uh, one thing that most uh, critical, most important when we are doing uh, integrating AD in our uh, rehabilitations and also uh, visit a relief, uh, relief response. Next slide, please. Dr. Sari will be sharing you some learning, but uh, we, you, you will find that it's mostly like a challenge, but uh, some uh, the other presenters uh, previously already shared some of the uh, key or some of the recommendations, but now we are uh, going to share you some, some challenges. Dr. Sari, time is yours. Yeah, so we got the learnings are, the need of F AT is mostly not included as people feel it's impossible to do AT rapid assessment as it may require individual measurement. It's not been easy to do during a crisis phase. 
and the availability of skill orthosis and prothesis or OP in Indonesia is still lacking. There are less than 500 OP in country in Indonesia with 280 million population. Additionally, the limited knowledge about the role of AT for people in need, such as disability, injured, and older person, make, makes it is not prioritized during a disaster response. And the geographical distance in Indonesia, combined with the lack of good AT providers in remote areas, makes the cost for providing AT in time of disaster is not cheap and not timely. And person with disabilities uh, is seen as an object. It, it is important to engage them, not only during disaster response and also need assessment, but also in the process of awareness raising, uh, of course, during pre-disaster step. And then the interministerial or intersectoral coordination in disaster management especially for provision of appropriate AT for people in need, remains a challenge. Policies exist, but the understanding on policies and its implementation are still lacking. So we also share our uh, some testimonies. Uh, next, please. Uh, some te testimonies from the people who receive AT. Uh, this is the first testimony. It shows how AT in its, it's very relevant to improve not only in their health condition, but even could be more importantly uh, in their social role with family and society after hit by disaster. Next, please. There is another testimony. Yeah. So thank you. This is uh, from Yakum. Thank you, thank, thank you, Maria. Back to you. Thank you both really very much for that. I, I think you started to give us a flavour of how you're starting to deliver some of these issues and also a, a, a bit of a perhaps a, a sort of a reality check on what the current context is. And I think it's it's been really interesting how it's sort of un, uh, unfolded over the course of the different presentations. So that's that's great. And I'm sure people have got lots of questions for you, so don't go away. Finally, Nadia, thank you for your patience. Uh, this is the last formal presentation, so we'll hand over to you, Nadia. And just a reminder, if you have questions, please post them in the chat box and we will have time at the end. Nadia, thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm time consuming, so I'll try to do fast to leave openness to the question and answer session. So thank you very much for inviting uh, us as EDF to be part of this uh, very important topic. You can go to the next slide, please. So the European Disability Forum, we are uh, defending the rights of more than 100 million uh, persons with disability living in Europe. We are an independent NGO and we are an umbrella organization with more than 100 uh, organizations as a member. We do a lot of advocacy at European level, at the Council of Europe, at the European Parliament, and uh, we try to implement the UN to fully the, implement uh, the Convention of the Right of Persons with Disability, together also the Sustainable Development Goals and the European Disability Rights Strategy and, all, and a lot of other international conventions. Next slide, please. So assistive technology and humanitarian uh, action for us as persons with disability is really including both the products and the related services which support uh, independence and inclusions. So this kind of assistive technology for us is critical to ensure participation of us in non-crisis time, but perhaps even more critical during humanitarian responses. Because even in non-crisis situation, in most of the countries in the world, access to assistive technology is very limited with only one in 10 having access to assistive projects that they really need. So access to assistive technology is critical to the realization of the rights of personal disability as described in the CRPD, where, where they really stipulate in all environments, which, need, which means also including in a humanitarian crisis. Furthermore, so access to uh, assistive technology make really financial sense because a recent study by AT scale found that a nine to one return on investment in the, in the provision of assistive, assistive projects to those who need them. So they cannot come back to us and say it's not cost effectiveness. It is when you invest it in the right way. Next slide, please. 
So what does it provide, this assistive technology? So it means uh, it's a means of escape from disaster and conflict environment, and also the communications avenue to receive and understand emergency communication. And it's also the ability to communicate needs with the first responders, with the representatives of organization responding to the crisis and other ways. It's also a means of access to necessary resources, including medical attention, food and water, shelter, and other basic needs. So this is important for very different groups. So people who are ex existing uh, already uh, using assistive technologies. Other group is people who, are, who have a short-term need or for assistive technologies due to injuries sustained due to crisis uh, and humanitarian crisis. Another part of group is people who develop a long-term need for assistive technologies as a result of a humanitarian crisis. Next slide, please. And also people who are used to use assistive technologies prior to the crisis, they may not have access to their devices following of major event like an earthquake or due to conflict in their environment of lack of uh, 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 electricity. And also for those who do have access to their devices, they might find it not suitable for conditions which arise because of humanitarian crisis. So people who sustain injuries or trauma as a result of humanitarian crisis may have a short or long-term need for assistive technology. So these people may not have been assistive technologies users before. So they are new, so they need to be really framed, trained, and, they, and the, the assistive technologies that we provide them need to be also adapted to their personal needs. We can go to the next slide, please. So um, in each of these situations, the person who use assistive technologies really requires support to obtain a kind of necessary alternative when existing systems for acquiring assistive product may not be relied on. So lack of access to assistive product, either they own a replacement or new devices for people who require them, increase again the vulnerability of persons with disabilities in this environment. So incoming emergency medical teams often are focused on short-term acute management of trauma and do not have significant capacity to provide assistive technology for those who need them at most. So the provision of assistive products require training and expertise to ensure that conditions are not made worse by inappropriate technology. And so this expertise, sadly enough, is often not found among the first responders. There is a major gap in humanitarian responses. It is also critical that any IT provider on a short-term basis by a first responder, a responder or emergency medical team is linking with appropriate following up services once the immediacy of the crisis have been passed. So it must be in continuity. And so also it has have been already said that research so that people will have access to appropriate assistive project have better recovery to trauma and injury sustained it during a disaster or a conflict. Next, next slide, please. So what should we do then to ensure access to assistive technologies through humanitarian actions? It must be done on different levels. So firstly, at local and national level, there must be an assistive technology policy. That's something crucial, either as a standalone policy or in conjunction with disability and other health and social care policies. And it must ensure access to services in non-crisis time and which are resilient to change. So these policies must be inclusive and must engage assistive technology users in their development through participatory processes. So from the beginning until developing the project until monitoring it. So it requires systems strengthening by all countries to ensure access to uh, assistive technologies is available for all who need that. And the continuity of plans must be established to ensure access to continuous assistive technology services. And these services must be deemed 
essential. So even in the COVID pandemic, research has shown that assistive technology providers were not deemed essential in many juris jurisdictions. So compounding the impact of COVID-related lockdowns on persons with disability. So they make it even the situation worse. And also third thing is that governments must understand the number and type of uh, assisted uh, products users in the country and provide adequate data on expected and or anticipated needs in crisis environment. We heard already all the speakers speak about uh, disintegrated data. So it's really to have a register and a database for all those users so they can help them to ensure access to the service throughout a humanitarian action. The next slide, please. And so on international or global level. So it's good that the first responders organization and the emergency medical teams must have assistive technologies expertise. This must be part of the guidelines which they are developed by the humanitarian actions for emergency responses. So being including from the beginning. So also assistive technology must be considered in the global responses to humanitarian crisis with appropriate technologies available to be distributed as necessary and variety of challenging environment. So not something that is used in regular area can fit when there is a disaster. So this response must be coordinated between national governments, international civil society organizations and responding humanitarian organizations. So working diverse and it would help to have more impact. So there must be a kind of mechanism for also the assistive technology users to access technologies in the absence of health and social care system in situation of internal displacement or in refugee situation. And the last thing again is data must be gathered and evaluated to inform the future responses, which are similar in nature. So um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, let's open the discussion now and see how we can join forces. Thank you. Great, Nadia, and thank you for sort of bringing the circle back round to the really importance of the policy framework to deliver all of this. I think we, we've really seen across the presentations how all of these things link into each other. So um, I'm very conscious we don't have a huge amount of time for questions, so I'm opening the floor. If people have questions, they can uh, either type them in the box or I think you can raise your hand. Um, I think. <laughs> um, and while you're thinking of your questions, I guess um, I will, Emma, there was a question in the box, I think, for you, if you wanted to answer it from Isabel, I think. Sure, yes, I can take that one to start. So the question that had been raised was around how we are integrating with the cluster system within the within Bangladesh and the Rohingya camps. So I can talk a little bit um, about some of the work we've done there. In, in Bangladesh, we have what we're called an age and disability working group, which is situated under the protection working group in the protection cluster. And so that is a member, uh, we've got a, quite a large member uh, base there. And it's also co-chaired by CBM, CDD, HelpAge, and HI. And so through the PWG, the idea is that the ADWG is the technical reference group, and the PWG can help us with sort of the linkages within the other the other sectors um, to help us link in how we influence the JRP processes, provide advocacy links for technical support and capacity building. So that is sort of the, if you want to say, our main entry point into the cluster system in, in the Rohingya camps where we are engaging. We are engaging in the other sectors as well. We've been quite engaged with the protection sector, the health sector, where we've been really looking at, we've done some advocacy around um, rehab as part of primary health care. We've shared the results of the RATA as well with the health sector. Um, and then we've also been engaging quite a bit with the wash sector around accessibility of wash facilities. Uh, those are the main main sectors, some engagement with food security and livelihoods as well as some of the other clusters, but those are the main ones which we have been engaging with the, with the whole purpose of trying to see how we can really influence the JRP processes, which we've seen um, over the years in continual engagement as well, that that has grown and strengthened with that engagement. Does that answer the question well, Isabel? I don't know if Isabel can actually answer. I'm hoping she can send a sign. <laughs> um, I, I think what's really, you know, while we're waiting for others to 
Oh, we've got some more questions in the box. I don't need to. OK, so a question from Ellie. So Emma says yes. Uh, Ellie, uh, Isabel says yes. So you have answered the question, I think. So this is a really interesting question and um, I'll see who it should go to. Ellie asks, by increasing the mainstreaming of assistive technology within health systems, how do you avoid a re-medicalisation of disability issues? Um, Gavin, you talked about addressing the whole ecosystem. Is it enough to strengthen the health system alone? Do you want to take that one, Gavin? That's it's quite a tough question, but some thoughts? It is a tough question. I, I, I think there are a number of opportunities in humanitarian settings where there are facilities that exist where they could be used as a function for, for screening, for fitting, for programming, hearing aids, etc., and distribution. So the health centre makes a more sustainable case for this, but it may be in some of the services required as part of this ecosystem, like early detection then school facilities might also act in, as a place for that. The jury's out. I think it, what we find in many humanitarian settings is the lack of these facilities and spaces uh, that are doing it. So I think the first opportunity is let's just, let's just at least, because this is what's missing, I think, just to underline the point, the capacity in most contexts for individuals, those working in the humanitarian space to understand these needs, to understand how we meet the needs and how we develop these uh, systems. So I think deciding on where best to place it is a bit of a luxury question when really we're trying to establish these things in the first place and then we can move towards perhaps a more sustainable piece. But I don't think it's going to re-medicalise. Uh, just on that, I think the pendulum swung very long into the social model um, and everyone started to fear, talk in fear about the medical model when in actual fact, you know, the international functioning classific classification um, really embraces both. And I think, you know, we do have to embrace both. There is a rehabilitation ang angle, there is a diagnosis, but there's also a huge set of barriers in the social space that we also need to tackle. So I, I don't think it will re-swing back and cause uh, any issues. I just think it's gonna redress the balance perhaps. Great answer, Gavin. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question. I can see Ashintri is typing to um, Albert's question. So I'll move on to Christian, who says, panelists have shared very good insights on the importance of AT in humanitarian action and as an area that it shouldn't be an ad hoc and standalone. So how is AT currently being considered in the humanitarian coordination mechanisms to ensure there is alignment in approaches? Wow. Tough question, Christian. And I wonder, do colleagues from Indonesia, Ashinta Sari, do you want to speak a little bit about that? Have you got any experience of actually aligning the, your your work with the responses in Indonesia? Uh, that's a very relevant question, uh, colleagues. Thank you for sharing uh, the question to us. Uh, I have to be honest that uh, to integrate the provisions of AT, especially amongst the uh, policy makers, the ones that have budget and resources to be allocated for uh, sponsoring it and to provide it is a challenge because most of them thought that uh, uh, AT is something that can be provided after uh, we entering the non-disaster uh, uh, phase. So when we talk to individually the ministry, uh, they said they have the budget, but uh, uh, most of the time what we find is that uh, uh, was it the type of AD that is uh, within the uh, standby items, uh, it is not uh, particularly for disaster response. So what, when I'm saying this, it, it, is, it means that uh, the type is not easily uh, to be transported to disaster area or it is only one type that cannot really fit into the needs of various uh, types of uh, disabilities. And we are talking about uh, the pre-existing disability condition that need AD and the AD is now gone after uh, broken by disaster and also a new pers a person with newly disability due to injury uh, after the, they are hit by disaster. So uh, most of the ministries, they do not have that kind of specific uh, allocations uh, and the standby item is only one single type, uh, maybe only wheelchair or only this thing. So it is a challenge. That's uh, in the government side. In the non-government side, in the amongst the CSO, the awareness is raising, but it is as uh, we are sharing with you, 
the provisions and also the transporting system is not easy. So even if the CSO or don uh, development uh, donors have that kind of budget for sponsoring or for supporting the uh, provisions, it is a challenge to provide it and to transport it into the area. When and, and so it's, it's, it's still a challenge. So, and uh, but it is good. Uh, because now we have what we call cluster system and uh, as uh, uh, Emma also shared uh, from the Bangladesh uh, context, we have the cluster system, the social protections and uh, I would say the, the disability and also other uh, uh, vulnerable group uh, it, uh, cluster and Dr. Sari can talk more about it, but it is still in the early uh, steps. So still far away uh, road to, to really meet the needs and also the rights. Actually, we are not talking about the needs, but also the right of person with disability. Thank you, Emma. I hope I am answering a bit. I think you did. You touched on a number of really important points there. And I think that that, that issue of coordination is it, it comes back a bit to the whole point about where the financing you know if we put the financing in a humanitarian response plan which of the sectors so uh, you know you, we might be talking about a child trying to access a piece of education technology but is that in the health budget so i guess these are some of the questions that are still some of the work that 80 20 30 that joel spoke about have, have been looking about about provision and financing and i think we we still there's some work to do around that um in the three minutes left alberto asked a really important question um in the global report on assistive technology it talks about the need for an, uh, a, a priority list for um, humanitarian context and alberto asked about the top needed at in different contexts Ashinti you very kindly answered it and said that there is um you you can refer to the existing list but you also talked about um action points that are still needed awareness raising education of the supply chain societies and more specialists and more policies so i'm going to come back and ask each one of my panelists as a final some what do you think the top need and it can be a product or it can be a policy it can be a p or it can be whatever so i'm going to start in reverse order with you nadia what's the top thing we need to do to really ensure at in humanitarian context is a, is is viable i think it's very important to include within the policy budget a multidisciplinary team and also that uh, assistive technology must be in combination of person assistance it cannot replace the human support and it should be financed and, and included diverse stakeholders from the beginning. Excellent. Thank Ashinta, thank you. Ashinta, one point, quick. <laughs> the, the central role of person with disability, Nadia has mentioned it, but I just echo it. The importance uh, role of person with disability as the center of the whole uh, it effort to make it uh, as a priority in the different level. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Sari. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So the earth is for sensitization and capacity building of humanitarian organization for the inclusion and promotion of uh, AT. Thank yes. you. Emma. This is hard when you're near the end, so I would have agreed with everything Nadia said, but I might also add the importance of proper assessment and training on assistive products and their maintenance, and it's not a, it's not a distribution of assistive products, but it's part of a whole therapy package. Thank you. Joel. I'm repeating no, others, sorry, I, I missed think. Gavin. I missed Gavin. Okay. Sorry, Gavin. Then you, Joel. Gavin. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I agree with everything. I think um, some of the key things we perhaps should consider is is you know we, is getting away, I guess, from a lot of the mobility to make sure we have a good cross section, and that requires all the things that colleagues have just mentioned. We need money. We need investment. We need to generate demand. Technology. And that's a perfect link into you, Joel. <laughs> yeah, I agree with all resources, certainly. Um, I would have probably said, you know, making disabled users the, the starting point of any intervention. Uh, I'll speak also to the, the necess necessity of understanding the full ecosystem in which these ATs are going to exist, from understanding the need right the way through to finally procuring and providing, um, and, and, and reaching out as well across sectors to other, if we're talking about resources, reaching out to the sector climate finance and climate change, reaching out to education and inclusion and understanding how ultimately we're talking about people's experiences and people's lives in which AT plays a role alongside other parts of uh, livelihoods and mobility. 
Brilliant. Look, you've been fantastic, panel. I hope everyone's enjoyed the discussion as much as I have. I think we've covered a huge range of topics. We've spoken about a lot of resources, a lot of things that need to be done. There was a clear call for action yesterday, and I think we're echoing that clear call for action around the provision of AT, particularly for us in humanitarian emergencies. Um, you will have access to this um, uh, recording after the session. I think it will be in a variety of um, websites, including the HPNW website. Um, please do feel free to contact any of us. Uh, um, we, most of us are pretty easy to find on Google. Um, and we want to continue these discussions. So it's I, I think I take great pleasure in thanking all of the panelists. Huge round of applause for all of you. You've been brilliant. And thank you to all of those that tuned in to listen um, to these presentations today. And let's continue this great work. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.